let me, I'm going to introduce Brandon just once this morning. Um, he's also our speaker for tonight. We are very, very fortunate to have him here. Um, Brandon is just one of the young stars in text analysis. Um, uh, as I mentioned last night, he's coming from, um, from the Gary King uh, tree. Uh, very strong pedigree, of course, um, and worked with Gary on a lot of, a wide range of interesting projects that, several of which were discussed um, last night. Um, Brandon is particularly um, uh, great at um, pushing the boundaries of existing methods. So um, he's going to tell us a little bit today about um, conventional topic models, but then he's going to get into um, extensions of the topic model, and, and especially one that he's developed with colleagues called the structural topic model. Um, this is really just a, a great way of push, pushing topic modeling forward for reasons he'll soon describe. And you know, yesterday I just want to add one more thing. Um, we had a brief conversation about um, con contributions to, the, to, to other people, right? Doing things for the collective good. Um, and we had a, a conversation about how hard that is to do as a junior person and how, you know, how much time goes into making things usable and accessible. And Brandon has just invested a ton of time into making just a really great R package, a really, really well documented, a vignette. And that's the kind of thing that is just such a selfless activity. Um, so if, if and when you use it, cite Brandon. Um, and um, let's just all uh, join me in thanking him for, for coming. He's, um, he's going to be with us until about 11 or 11.15 if you need to go over. I think that's fine. Um, and, uh, and then again at 4. So join me in waking up. everybody. Um, so um, there's a lot of potential ground to cover. Like I could probably teach like a, like a whole like semester long class on topic models if you know um, you guys really wanted to be here but we have like you know 45 minutes. So um, we're just gonna we're gonna roll. It's gonna be great. Um, stop me if, if something is, is unclear and, um, and, and we'll kind of jump around as we need to. Um, okay so um, Okay, so I'm going to draw from a few different things here. There's a paper that I wrote with Justin Grimmer, also one of Gary King's students, um, uh, called Text as Data, Promise and Pitfalls of Automated, Automatic Content Analysis for Political Text. Uh, this has a lot of the material that I'm going to talk about. It is also a, a pretty good review of, of, of what you can do with text analysis circa 2013. Um, and then some other papers about the structural topic model. Okay, so the backdrop here, um, as, as um, uh, Chris mentioned earlier today, is that there's been this massive increase in unstructured text uh, uh, due to all of these, these different new things, new social structures, new improved data collection, new digitization efforts. And communities have left digital footprints that potentially we want to track, we want to measure, we want to understand. And so tools for analyzing this text have also been advancing in, in parallel. Gary talked about some last night. I'll talk about some, some more today. Um, but the key insight here is that text by itself, at least at the scale we're talking about, is essentially useless, that you need some way of systematically distilling information from it because uh, you can't actually read millions and millions and millions of documents. Um, and so we go about this process that about importing methods from different fields. I'm going to talk about some that we've really imported from, from computer science. It's also the case that once you have new analysis techniques, they can sort of paradoxically introduce new data. Um, so uh, there was a, a point where um, we were trying to get access, I was trying to get access to uh, some information from the Library of Congress. They have this big project chronicling America that collects all of these uh, uh, digitized news reports. And they had it such that you could download them like one news report at a time. And, and I went to them and I was like, well, I can, I can like bombard your server by like scraping all of these, but like maybe you could just give us these like, you know, give it to me all in like one bulk download. And, and they said, they were like, I don't even like, why would we, why would someone even want that? Like, why would you want all of these news reports? And I'm like, no, 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 it's okay. I have math. Like, I don't have to read them all. I've got math. Um, and, uh, and so now that you can just go to the Chronicling America homepage and get bulk downloads of OCR, that like the, the, the fact that they, it had not occurred to them that someone would want that. And once the tools were available to analyze it, they started to provide it. And I think that story is sort of playing out across lots of different data sources. So there's a couple of different types of methods that we, we want to understand. Um, supervised learning is, we might think of as pursuing a known goal. 
So the basic procedure is this. A human comes in and annotates a subset of documents, like a randomly sampled set of maybe like a few thousand. And then the algorithm goes through and annotates the rest in the collection. So it takes what you've done on a few thousand documents and it extends it to you know, the untold millions that you have access to. <coughs> and we might think about this as the usual paradigm of, of uh, quantitative research, right? It's, there's, a, there's a thing that we want to estimate, we learn how to estimate it, we predict it on other things. In unsupervised learning, the goal is to learn what the goal is. We, we're going to have an algorithm that's going to come in and it's going to discover themes and patterns in the text, things that like com, you know, continually reoccur. And the human effort is going to be in interpreting those results and telling, telling a story with them, figuring out what, what they measure, what they can capture for us. And we might think about this as something associated with qualitative research, right? Like we might go into the field and we're observing sort of all the things around us and the human's task is to sort of distill the story from, from you know, the, the vast swath of things. And so there's a sense in which this sort of very quantitative activity I'm going to show you today is fundamentally qualitative. To the, to the question that came up during Gary's lecture uh, last night about sort of divides between quantitative and qualitative research, I think this is an example of where that divide is like disappearing. Like this is the kind of task that takes a lot of qualitative skill to do well, but it also takes a lot of quantitative skill because you have to actually be able to like work with the math and the software and you have to have the skills you guys are building up here. So both of these strategies, importantly, amplify human effort, but in different ways. If, if someone tells you that they have a form of text analysis that does not involve the human at all, you should be deeply suspicious. Uh, it's one reason to be like deeply suspicious of someone that says, I have a dictionary that just measures exactly what you want already, and you don't have to do anything. And you don't have to look at the text, and you don't have to validate, you don't have to do anything. That, that all of these methods are about taking the work that you put in and force multiplying it. But it's, it's gonna happen in a different part of the process. Here it's gonna happen uh, after you've run the analysis, and here it's gonna happen before you've run the analysis. So we're gonna focus today on, on the unsupervised uh, uh, methods. The, the supervised ones are, are also really useful, it's just in many ways they're like more conceptually straightforward. Okay, so I wanna take a, a particular thing to, to draw a line between how topic models that, that this, this unsupervised technique I'm going to show you, they exist in computer science, but I want to talk about the role that they have in the social science research flow. So these, these core methods were developed elsewhere, and they're used primarily as a way to summarize unstructured text. We have millions of documents, we just sort of roughly want to know what's in them. And the idea here is we're going to use the words that are within a document to infer its subject. And I'm going to talk in, in great detail about how exactly that works, but that's the, the, the premise. We're sort of inferring subject matter. And we think about it as a form of dimensionality reduction, right? It's hard to look at like all the different words in a text, but if we can think about the text as summarizing, say, a few key ideas, it, that's easier for us to process. <coughs> so in the social sciences, we typically want to use these topics as a form of measurement, which is not the sense of which they were originally developed. Um, and we're interested generally in how an observed covariate drives some trend in the use of language. So the idea that men maybe talk more about something than women, or that Republicans talk more about something than Democrats, or when you make this change in an electoral system, it changes what legislators talk about. Right? These are the, the kinds of, of things that go to social science questions. And, and again, to sort of Gary's comment yesterday, right, this is it's sort of like uh, social scientists asking the how and the why question. Yeah. So you're talking about the language as sort of a dependent variable. Do you ever see it as an independent variable? Yes, and you will, you will, you will also see it as an independent variable in my talk this afternoon. We're going to talk about text as a, as a treatment, text as an outcome, and text as a confounder. So we're just going to put it everywhere. It's going to be great. But not all at the same time, because that's, that's you know, next year. Okay. So, um, so we're telling a story about how, we're telling a story about why. The different focus on social science means that we have different concerns, right? We're not as concerned about scaling it to thousands or millions of texts. We're not as concerned about training the model in, like, a fraction of a second. I mean, we care about those things. That's, like, helpful. But the, the concern that we have primarily is about validation. And this is, again, back to the sort of qualitative techniques, the things that are really more 
the social science side of computational social science. That to know that it's a good measure, we have to be doing the things to check that it's a good measure. Um, so um, I'm, I'm actually just going to skip example questions uh, on the slides. If you want to see this, is just a bunch of different questions people have used for topic models. Um, uh, in, you know, in general, they are measuring the subject matter of something. I'll, I'll pick one just to kind of fix ideas. Uh, this work by Amy Catalinic in her book, um, she looks at electoral reform change in Japan and basically shows that when you, when you change the structure of elections, you change how representatives are, are um, elected, they change what they talk about. Right? And that's, that's a case where, again, like the text is the outcome. Right, We, we want to know what are the things that representatives are trying to get elected on the basis of. And we're showing that that is connected to the, the system that they're running in, which is you know, something of interest to political scientists. So in the Grimmer and Stewart piece, um, we, we set out four principles for working with text analysis. And I, and I wanted to step through them briefly, because I think that they help to frame the use of these methods in the, the social sciences, and then we'll get to specific techniques. So the first is that all quantitative models of language are wrong, but some are useful. This is just like a, you know, like a bastardization of the, of the famous box quote. Um, and the idea here is that the data generation process for text is unknown. And, and it's really, really complicated, right? People don't spew out bags of words. I mean, certain people in certain elected offices at the moment sometimes feel like they're spouting out bursts of words. But, but in general, we don't believe that's happening. Um, and language is complex. So you, you get things like time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like a banana, right? There's a lot going on in that sentence that makes that, that work and, and, and makes that funny. Make peace, not war is another example where you have, there's some like complexity to the language. Make war, not peace is like a whole different thing, right? Going back to the word order thing that, that Chris was talking about. Um, and so you get these, these sentences that, that have a great deal of complexity that aren't just bags of words. And so it means that we're not gonna have a model that's correct. And I, I think arguably that's just true in like almost every regression model as well. We have like approximations to things. We don't actually have regression models that generate the world, but it's in particularly important to realize here. Um, and because models necessarily fail to capture language, it means that they are useful for specific tasks only, right? And so we need to figure out what are the specific tasks? What is the feature of the text that is right for you to capture for the thing you want to do with the model? It's also going to imply that we need to do validation. We're going to come back to this. But we need to demonstrate that the methods that we're choosing perform for the task that we are using them on. Okay, so principle two. Uh, quantitative methods augment humans, not replace them. So this is a process of computer-assisted reading, right? It's not computers replacing reading. It's computers amplifying your effort in some way. Um, and so quantitative methods, the role that they have is to organize and direct and suggest things that we, we might better read or ways that we might organize a text, not that they're, they're sort of going to replace humans in general. And the human role in this is then to read and interpret, right, and to flesh out what these, what these patterns the computer is telling us actually mean. Okay, principle three, there's no globally best method for automated text analysis. Um, this is sort of a consequence of the previous two points, but it's basically to say that, um, you know, sometimes there are things we want to do. We have certain known categories. We may want to use supervised methods. We might want to discover categories. We might want to use unsupervised methods. Even within these, there's going to be lots of circumstances where we don't know exactly the right method or there isn't going to be one method that's going to work best for all circumstances. What this means is if someone comes to you and they're pitching a method, the question you shouldn't be asking is like, is your method better than every other method? The question you should be asking is like, what's the scope condition, right? What is the circumstance where this performs well? And that answer might be, um, you know, sentiment analysis of Yelp reviews, right? And, and that's, that's helpful to know. You, you want to know that. But there's probably not going to be, say, a single best sentiment analysis method. And so we want to debate these things. We want to acknowledge the differences and, and, and um, think about that. OK, so the last principle is validate, validate, validate. The, the in, in principle is so important, we, we named it thrice. Um, and the idea here is that these methods have different uh, variable performance across tasks. 
And so we want to make sure that it's performing well in our circumstance. There's very few theorems to guarantee performance, and in fact, um, there's actually some theorems that guarantee that you can't have universally best performance, which is, is like even worse, right? It's like we can basically guarantee the opposite. Um, so we will apply methods, and then we want to validate them. And the validation is often like sort of boring and, and a little bit um, application specific. And so, you know, it's, it's hard. It's a difficult thing to do. People want to sort of drop it out of the analysis, but it's really, really important, and you want to be careful with that. Um, so avoid the blind application of methods, you know, check, check your work. Okay, so um, having covered some principles, um, I'm, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some topic models, um, starting with the, the first one, which is latent Dirichlet allocation and is the sort of canonical topic model, um, arguably where a lot of this literature starts, although there are things that precede it in useful ways. Um, and then we'll talk about some, some variants and some sample applications. Um, there's some slides about pre-processing. Um, I'm actually just going to skip over them because you guys kind of just did them. Um, and we'll just jump to the fact that we're going to have a representation that maybe looks like this. So every document is going to have a count of the words it contains. Those words can be phrases because we decided that we, we cared about phrases. Uh, that's, I think, going to come back after I finish talking. Can I just jump in and say one thing? Please. Just, um, we're going to link to Brandon's STM vignette, which is going to give you code for the what, what Brandon's about to get to. We don't have any code for basic LDA up there right now. Um, I can show you resources on my website later where you can get that. Um, but just, to, just in case you're trying to look at the code right now, it's not there. STM okay. will be there. Excellent. Sorry about that. No, no worries. Okay, so we're going to have this representation that's just the individual words and the count of times those words appear in a given document. And that's, that's the representation we're going to work with uh, today. We could have other representations, but this is the canonical sort of bag of words. We have bag because we, you know, sort of thrown all the words in a bag and shook them up and got rid of word order. Is this supervised or unsupervised? What? Is this where you pre-specify these are the words or is it... Or is this just for every single word in the document? That's so generally, it's it's every word in the document, and then you do some kind of filtering after the fact. So um, maybe you um, drop words that are really, really rare. So um, for example, the pre-filtering pre functions in STM, by, by default, drop words that only appear once in the entire corpus, under the theory that if it only appears once in the entire corpus, it's probably going to be very difficult to learn anything about it. Okay. Um, uh, you know, sometimes people drop stop words or words that are like extremely common and that are assumed to carry no meaning, like he, she, the, of, for. Uh, sometimes those things do carry meaning, and so you, you have to be careful. It's like depending on your circumstance. So, at, like, at what stage in the process of putting this together would you have come up with the idea of keeping barrel of a gun together rather than? Separate. Would that be after reading a few sample documents, or? Yeah. So it depends. So um, sometimes people come to it with, um, you know, they know that for the concepts that they care about, that they're going to need little phrases. Um, sometimes it's you, you know, you start to you run a topic model, you look at the words, and you start to see all of these phrases that have been chopped up, and you just think, oh God, I need to just put those together so it's clearer. Um, it. There's a, there's a package in R called Freeze Machine, which is very nice, um, that, that like uses some simple patterns to discover uh, phrases, and so you can do it sort of inductively from the text. There's a lot of different approaches. I think because it is easier, most of the time people just use single words, but it, it, it is amazing. Like This is like one of those like underappreciated ideas. Like you, you can get a lot of leverage out of just adding some simple phrases. So let's talk about LDA. So the idea of LDA is that, um, how many people have seen LDA before? Let me just start there. Oh, fantastic. OK. Um, OK. I'm going to give a quick summary because it wasn't everybody, but, um, but, but feel free to, to, to push me on details here. Um, so the basic idea is that documents each exhibit a topic with some proportion. This is the idea of an admixture. So it's not that the entire document is about topic one. It's that it's like 20% about topic one, 30% about topic two, et cetera, et cetera. And so every document is a mixture over topics, and every topic is a mixture over words. 
And what LDA is estimating is the distribution of words for every topic and the proportion of a document in each topic for each document. All right, let's just, um, and, and throughout this, we're going to assume that we have this bad words representation. We're going to fix the number of topics ex ante. So let's just quickly go through what this means in pictures. Um, we have these uh, fine hatted gentlemen here who are very happy. They have a big smile on their face because they have nice hats. And um, they're each going to write some text. And this text, we're going to discuss a few different topics. There's some about topic one. There's some about topic two. So what LDA is going to go in and estimate is the distribution over words for each topic, right? So in this case, it might be that uh, the high probability words in this topic are Congress, nations, power, votes, agreement, and bargaining. And so I'm just going to call that politics, right? It, it doesn't estimate the word up here at top in color. It's just like that's after reading some documents and looking at the most probable words, what I have decided is, is captured by this um, uh, by this distribution of a word. And down here we have a, a different set of uh, uh, words that relate to statistics, estimator, data analysis, variance, et cetera, et cetera. We're then going to go through and estimate the proportion of each document that is in each topic. So that 70% of this document is about politics and 30% is about statistics. And we'll do that for all of the topics. Okay. So this infrastructure is a, a Bayesian model. Um, how, how many people have seen Bayes before, like Bayesian statistics? <laughs> wow, you guys are awesome. OK, um, yay. Yay for Bayes. Um, OK, so <laughs> like Bayes. Um, OK, so this is something called the, the plane notation uh, for the model. Um, I, I just want to very briefly walk you through how this, this works. So the idea is, is that there's some distribution over the vocabulary that we'll call beta k. That's the document. So it's the dis I mean, the uh, topic. So it's the distribution over words. And then every document i has some distribution over the topics that we'll call theta. Those are both going to come from a Dirichlet distribution. For those who haven't seen Dirichlet distributions, it's a distribution over proportions. Every word in document i is going to have a topic. So that's uh, Z. So we're going to draw a topic that's like, uh, you know, this word, next word, it's going to be topic three. And then based on that topic, we're going to draw a word from the distribution over words. And so this breaks down into saying we're going to have a unigram model of language, where unigram just means that, you know, it's, it's, we're drawing like individual words. We're going to have a model for the document proportions. We're going to have a model for what topic each word is, and we're going to have a model for the words. So the task here is to discover thematic content of, of documents, and maybe to have like a way of just very quickly exploring them, right? So this is useful, say, if you're a journalist and you're, you suddenly have, have um, you know, a set of documents, hundreds of thousands of documents, you want to say something systematic about what's there, you want to find some way of browsing through them quickly, this is the kind of task that's, the, uh, uh, kind of uh, method that's very helpful for you. And so there's some objective function here that's a function of the words and all of these, these parameters, uh, where these parameters just are the components that I just told you about before. Basically, the proportion of every document allotted to a topic and the distributions over words and some hyperparameters. And so the optimization process is we're going to go through with one of these generally three uh, techniques, and we're going to find the model that best fits the data. Okay. Um, I can talk about these in Q&A if you guys are interested or like maybe like, I don't know, when I'm just hanging around today. Uh, these are quite different ways of, of fitting this model, and they have quite different implications, um, uh, which is something I would happily talk about at length, but probably is not good for right now. I just have a quick, quick question. Yeah. Is there a way to recover which, um, like, specific word assignments in the documents for each topic? Yes. Yes. Um, so, so conceptually, um, that is captured by this Z. Every token in the document gets a uh, um, uh, topic assignment. Um, now, depending on whether or not your 
which of these kinds of optimization methods you're doing, that might be easier or harder. So that comes very naturally out of the collapse Gibbs sampling framework. Um, it's a little bit harder in variational inference because, um, simply because it's, um, uh, like it's very memory intensive. Um, and uh, you can't really get it at all in the spectral factorization methods, but that's fine. Okay. Um, and then, so, um, so you have this task, you have an objective function, we optimize it, and then we want to go through and validate it, probably in some application-specific way. So we can think about this as a statistical highlighter, right? Basically what it's doing is it's going through and in a, in a document it's saying, well, there's some topic, let's say, about genetics, and we have a bunch of assignments here of all of these, these words that are sort of in red are this you know, genetics topic. And we could imagine every single word here is highlighted in some color, right? And um, what we have is, in the document as a whole, then, is a distribution over the colors with which the individual words were highlighted. So why does this work, right? So there's a lot of, there's a lot of math here. There's some um, uh, uh, very cool math uh, that I'm happy to talk about. But, but, there's, a, but there's not really any magic, right? There's a, there's a basic logic, and it's a logic of co-occurrence. So if we think about the document term matrix again, so this is, I've, I've just sort of transposed it, so it's just on its side. But like, there's, there's a given document, and there's a count of, of each word. Um, what we're doing is we're learning the patterns of what words co-occur together, right? When we see this word 2 and word J are constantly showing up together, we sort of infer that they're about the same thing. And so the model is, is navigating a certain tension. It wants a topic to contain as few words as possible, and it also wants a document to contain as few topics as possible. And what that forces it to do is put together the words in a given topic that often show up together. Because that's how it's able to have a parsimonious representation both of the topic and the document at the same time. So this is, this is the, the logic that underlies basically every topic model. Right? And it's, it's a logic of a, like a low dimensional representation. Right? We, we think that there's there's a lot of complex words out there, but there's also just something simpler that's sitting under the hood. Yeah. Could you discuss whether this tension might invite a splitting up the documents, like by paragraph, for example, or like section? You know, if like you're thinking like a contract or a, a, a statute or a law or something, and there's going to be multiple sections that have different topics, which would you probably want to split up the different pieces and treat them as individual documents? rather than treat the whole contract, the whole law, or the whole story or something as, as, a, as a document. Um, and and I, I wonder if you've tried experimenting with that. Um, could, would, would you want to retain some information about the fact that these are multiple sections in the same document, but in terms of LDA purposes, uh, they're treated separately because they're probably about different, uh, different topics? Yeah, so, um, so that's great. So, so the thing that's going on with the, the documents here, I should be clear, is that you don't have to let like, the world dictate to you what a document is, right? So a, a document is just an unordered set of tokens that you want to summarize. And so if you want to summarize the topics of any given section of a, of a, of a piece, you can just break it up into sections, um, as, as sort of is being suggested here, and like run the topic model on each one separately. Now, it, it may be that you want to tie together the various sections in, um, in a given document, right? You want to say, like, well, ex ante, we believe that sections that come from the same contract are probably about similar things. And that's something that the structural topic model will be able to do in a second. But in just the pure LDA sense, we just chop it up into bits. Um, this is something that the digital humanities people often do. So if you're trying to run an analysis on a novel, uh, you don't want to be doing a bag of words method on a whole novel because it means that a word that appears on page one and a word that appears on the last page are like assumed to co-occur in the same way as two words in the same sentence. And that's, you know, crazy town, right? You, you, you're not going to get anything useful. And so what they end up doing is chunking them into like sets of about like 250 to 1,000 words. Um, you could chunk them by paragraph. You could chunk them in all kinds of different ways. And one of the things that... Um, 
I'm, I'm working on right now is sort of ways to make it very easy to chunk up documents and put them back together and like summarize the, the whole. Um, you can do that now manually with the STM, but it takes a lot of work and I'm trying to basically figure out a way to make it easier for people to do that. Okay. Um, all right, so have there been extensions to LDA? Uh, yeah, uh, so part of it being a Bayesian model makes it extremely easy to sort of swap out components and, and extend. And so um, there have been correlated topic models and dynamic topic models and so, so many other things. Eventually, I just got tired of writing them, and so I stopped. Um, but there's, there's like a whole cottage industry in computer science of just like coming up with variants of LDA, often helpfully called a uh, fancy sounding word, space LDA, which is uh, it's great. Um, and so um, there's different methods for every problem. And the place that, that I came to this a few years ago um, was saying, well, what is going on with all these extensions? And I, I think part of it is, is that people want a model that's customized to their corpus, that exploits the form of structure that they have, whether or not that's the fact that you have a bunch of documents that are by the same author, you have a bunch of paragraphs that are contained within the same contract, you have a bunch of things that are ordered in time. But all of these fix basically one of those problems, right? They say, oh, I'm just going to deal with the time element, or I'm just going to deal with the author element. And so what we wanted to do with the structural topic model is create a format that made it very easy for, for you as a researcher to sort of construct your own custom model on the fly. And so, um, so because, um, and, and um, this is just, uh, my, my, my students know this one, uh, I am always over optimistic about the amount I can cover. I talk very quickly and I just think, yeah, I can just talk faster, it's gonna be fine. Uh, but I'm gonna skip a bunch of these extensions and just jump to the structural topic model so I don't steal all of, of Chris's time a bit later. Uh, but they're in the slides if you want to see the correlated topic model and the dynamic topic model and the expressed agenda model. But let's talk about structural topic models. So as I'm suggesting, what's going on with the STM is it's latent Dirichlet allocation plus that contextual information that we want to use to sort of make our own custom model on the fly. And we're going to have a, a, an idea of two types of contextual information that came basically from me sort of like looking at the literature and saying, okay, like what is it that people are actually trying to do with this information? And there's, there's two notions. There's topic prevalence that varies by metadata. So for example, um, maybe a city paper in China is more likely to cover a protest than a provincial paper, right? It's the idea that, that um, one group talks more about something than another group. And then there's topical content, right? Which is that maybe those city papers talk about protests in a different way. They use a different language set. Maybe when, when men talk about an issue, they use a different set of words than women use. Maybe when Republicans talk about a certain issue, they talk differently than Democrats do. And so including this context can help improve the, the model, right? It gives you a little bit more accurate estimation, and it often provides much better qualitative interpretability. So let's just go back to our fine had a gentleman that explained um, uh, uh, LDA to us. Um, he's still very happy. He still has a very nice hat. But we're going to say, actually, it's not that everybody is the same. It's that like people are different, right? And so maybe we have this distinction of, um, of gender, right? So there's a guy, and, and now there's um, uh, 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 two nice women here. And, and we're going to say, perhaps, that the words in these topics vary by gender. So for example, um, you know, just sort of using the you know, usual uh, uh, color uh, um, associations, um, I put the sort of words that are more related to men in blue, the words more related to women in pink, and um, words that they sort of use equally in black, right? So maybe when men talk about statistics, they use the word data more, women use the word inference more, and they use estimator analysis variance and model at about the same rate. We can also allow topic proportions to vary by some piece of metadata. Maybe it's the same metadata. Maybe it's the gender difference. Maybe it's something else like um, groups in an experiment, right? So maybe these two people were assigned to one group and this person was assigned to a different group. And we can have sort of an arbitrary number of different types of, of metadata. 
So more formally, what's going on here, and, and this is going to be true of, of, of most of uh, these mixed membership topic models, we're going to have a user-specified number of topics that we'll call K. That's just the letter that everybody uses, because uh, that's what Dave Bly used that one time in that first paper, uh, how most notation gets started. Um, then uh, we're going to have some basic observed data. So we're going to have a bunch of documents. And each document is a collection of tokens. Right? This is the bag of words thing. It's just we just reached into a bag and a bunch of different words there. Every token is going to be a particular word from a vocabulary with a dictionary of V entries. So there's some like finite vocabulary. And so we can summarize this data in a single matrix we'll call W. So this is this term document matrix we had that's just the documents along the rows, the words along the columns, and the count of the word appearance in that document. So STM is going to add some topic prevalence covariance, so some information about each document that affects or we think might affect the, the rate at which a topic is discussed. And topical content groups, so different groups of of documents that talk about content in a particular way. And right now in the software, it's sort of set up that these are like discrete groups. And that's sort of like a pragmatic limitation. It's not really like a limitation of the setup. Um, and so what we're going to learn is the proportion of the document, of each document on each topic. So this is like essentially the thing we're trying to measure, right? We want to be able to summarize document in terms of how much it's about the environment or something like that. That's what's going to be captured here. And we have the probability of drawing a word conditional on a topic. Right? So we have um, the thing that tells us that that topic is capturing the environment because it has words like you know, green and earth and, I don't know, environment words. Okay. And so what this is getting us in a statistical sense is essentially just a low rank approximation to the expected counts, where I'm, I'm basically saying expected because we're working with the proportions, right? We're sort of getting rid of document length, and we're just focusing on the proportion of words from each topic. And so for people who have done work with low rank approximations, that's, that's like all that's going on here. It's that if we matrix multiply this, this set theta by beta, we get approximately the, the document normalized uh, word counts. That doesn't mean anything to you. That's totally fine. It's just really helpful for people who've done some like linear algebra. OK, so how does the structural topic model differ? Here is the, the data generating process uh, basically for LDA. There's, there's this theta, there's this beta, and there's a word language model at the bottom. And what we're going to do is we're going to replace this bit up here, the, the, the documents uh, association with each topic. We're going to replace that with a logistic normal generalized linear model which is basically we're going to run a regression, right? We're going to put a regression up here that says that we expect that a particular document uh, uh, is some, you know, it's, it's topic proportions. We expect that it is some function of the given covariance. So it's, you know, maybe men talk more about this than women. Maybe this use of this topic increases over time. Maybe it increases and then drops again. It can be very flexible. And then down here, we're going to include, optionally, a multinomial logit with covariates. That is that every topic is going to be a sparse combination of a baseline word distribution. So that's like just like this word, you know, that captures the idea that like certain words are just more frequent than others. A deviation from that distribution that's based on the topic, a deviation based on the covariate, and a devi deviation based on the interaction. So what does that capture? captures the idea that when we talk about the environment, there's certain words that are going to be more frequent or less frequent, irrespective of the covariate group we're in. There's going to be some things that say, uh, let's say that the, the, the covariate, content covariate is gender. There's going to be some things that men just speak about more than women. That's going to be captured here. And then there's going to be some deviations that affect how men talk about the environment or how women talk about the environment. And that's going to be captured here. So um, we can also just go in and like point estimate this and not use any content covariates at all. So in that case, like these two pieces are basically separable. We can like just do this piece or just do this piece or do both at the same time. So um, that leads to this uh, sort of slightly more complicated plate notation 
but it is still basically the LDA model. We've just added some complications, right? We've just added a little bit of structure that helps to, to provide some information. Now, this is really useful. Uh, so to go back to this example of the contracts before breaking into sections, we could think about um, all of the sections that come from one contract as having a dummy variable that says it goes with this contract. And we could put that dummy head of dummy variables up here in the topic prevalence model. And what that does is it allows the model to share information across different sections from the same contract. So in the, same, in, in the way that within a given document, right, we, we have co-occurrences of words and we use that to infer they're about the same thing, we can think about multiple words co-occurring across sections of, of, of a contract as being kind of like weak co-occurrences that move through this prior. Okay. So, um, so just like in LDA, what we're going to do here is we're going to define a probabilistic model and we're going to estimate the parameters of that model. Um, we're going to use Bayesian estimation with variational inference. Um, this is, this is uh, non-trivial. Uh, I'm super happy to talk about it. I usually don't get to because people don't want to talk about the gory details of these things. That's why we have a software package. But um, feel free to catch me if you're like, man, I have burning questions about non-conjugate variational inference. I am there for you. <laughs> okay. Um, there's also some very careful initialization. Uh, this is just one of these things in, in computational social science. We pick a lot of models that often don't have unique um, optimization solutions. So where you start is it affects where you end up. So like neural networks are like this. Lots of other complicated models are like this. And in those settings, you have to be very, very careful about how you choose the starting values of your parameters. And we have a, a particular method uh, that works as part of, I think, a, a big part of why I think the STM package works very well. And if you guys want to, to use it, um, I highly recommend you use the spectral initialization. Um, but you can change initialization types in the package. It's very easy to do. The logic here, though, all the complication aside, is the same. We're using word co-occurrences to discover topics. Um, what's nice about the covariate infrastructure that I talked about is it's general to lots of kinds of corpus structure. If you have Authors, great, put them in as dummy variables. If you have time trends, great, put them in as some kind of smooth function of time. If you have time trends of authors, great, interact them. It's totally fine, right? You're, you're able to build on the fly something that works for your circumstance. And so that allows us to implement this framework in a way that you don't actually have to do any like hard coding to make this work. Another thing that um, we, we put a lot of energy to into to, to doing the STM package, and, and this is, um, I mentioned co-authors on my, my first slide, but here, you know, just acknowledge that in particular Molly Roberts and Dustin Tinkley, who, who um, worked on this package with me, um, the, the, the thing that's nice about it is it's a complete workflow. So it goes from raw text all the way through figures that you can put in publications. And pretty much every figure that we've done from papers that we've done, you can generate as sort of defaults in the package. And so, um, and so, you know, it might be that you want to pop your text into, like, say, Quantita to do the processing because you want to do something fancy, and that's totally good, and, and, and maybe you should do that. But if you just want to get, like, a quick start, we have a nice little function called text processor, and it'll just go in there and take raw text and, like, generate all the Word document matrix stuff for you. And it'll do all those steps that Chris was talking about earlier. And then when you're building the model, you just use a little regression style syntax that's common to R, right? Um, so people who've done R before will, will sort of recognize something like this. It kind of looks like the back half of a regression formula. Um, here, there's some information about the paper, and there's some smooth function of time. And we built in these, these sort of spline functions to make it really easy to have kind of uh, uh, smooth um, bendy functions. Right, because you don't necessarily believe that the time trend like looks like a line, right? Like you might think it like jumps around a little bit. There's lots of functions for summarization, visualization, and checking, and there's a complete vignette online with examples. Yeah. Is there a maximum number of documents that you can? Always, always. Uh, yeah. So, um, so we have run it on a few hundred thousand before. Um, it, 
the the sort of limiting um, okay so the having content covariates really increases the memory I would say you're gonna hit memory problems before you hit anything else the things that dominate the memory are there is a matrix that is the number of topics by the number of words so if your vocabulary is like 60,000, 100,000, that matrix gets large very quickly. And there is a matrix that is the number of documents by the number of topics. And so if you have, you know, 200 topics, that matrix gets very large very quickly in the number of documents. So we've done things that are like, you know, 30, 40 topics for a few hundred thousand documents on a fairly low vocabulary. Um, but it could also be that, you know, you're trying to run 250 topics, 20,000 words in the vocabulary, and so, like, you know, it's going to, like, kick out, you know, around, like, 50,000 documents or something. Um, I, it's something that I would like to continue to um, improve, um, and particularly get rid of some of the dependence on the number of documents in the, in the size, um, but it's kind of difficult to do it without breaking everybody's code, so I'm still working on that, but, yeah. Yeah. So, um, back to Rochelle's question of whether you can recover the words for each topic. Yeah. Didn't you say that the spectral method can't, or is this a different spectral method? So, it's the same spectral method, but we're only using it as an initialization. So, um, it's, it's just, um, it's just how you choose the starting values of the parameters, which is, is great because these, these all have a property that they are non-convex optimization problems, which basically means that you can only find a local maxima of your optimization function. But the spectral methods actually have the property that they are globally consistent asymptotically, right? So it's like you have an infinite amount of data, it will find the right solution. And so we use it to sort of pick where to start. And my experience with these methods is that they are not very good estimators for any reasonable size of document we would have, like, 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 you know, maybe they work with billions of documents, but like, even at millions, they have problems. But they are really good at sort of hitting, like, like a, like a solid initialization, like, like putting us in the right space such that it does better <coughs> than other options we tried. We have a paper about this if you're sort of interested in more, but that's what's going on there. The second question, I mean, maybe to that point. So you said we should be suspicious of anything that sort of is a prepackaged processing yeah. of documents yeah. because it may not be customized to what we want. There needs to be a human involved. So, so this whole STM package and the complete workflow, what should we be suspicious of or what should we be paying attention to? Yeah, so part of how we define the workflow is we try to make it very easy for you to investigate the model. So we have some add-on packages that will make browsers for you that let you read documents. We have functions that will go find documents for you to read that are, um, you know, particularly related with certain topics. There's a nice, for those who know data.table, there's a nice, like, querying function where you can, like, easily write arbitrary queries and get documents. And so the, the answer is you want to be making sure that whatever topics you get are, like, you know, that you're that you're investigating what is going on with these particular relationships. And so that's the, but we try to make that process as, e as easy as possible. Um, it would be kind of difficult to talk about all the things that could potentially go wrong. And a lot of the times you just, I don't know, you need to look under the hood to make sure. I mean, I often think about these things as, a, as an exercise of sort of minimizing surprise, right? If I tell you what the topic label is, you should be, have the least amount of shock possible when you go read a document that is about that topic label. Because if I tell you it's about the environment and then you go read it and it's about like a polluter or something, you're going to go, oh. and that might be an issue of me not choosing the label well, but it also might be an issue of the model is just not grouping things together in a way that's useful to you. Uh, so with both this and uh, vanilla LDA, I'm just curious about the kind of variation that can occur. You know, I run it, I get my topics, I run it again, I get something slightly different. Yeah. Is there a way of quantifying or evaluating how stable it is or making some decision about, you know, whether it's producing good results in whatever way you'd measure, measure that? Yeah, great question. Um, so this is a question we've thought about a lot. Um, it's one reason I like the spectral initialization. It's deterministic, and so for given topics, for a given corpus, it will get you the same answer every time, uh, which is quite nice. 
Um, is that the right answer? Uh, we don't know, right? I mean, this is, this is the problem with difficult optimization problems. Um, you know, asymptotically, it's the right answer. Does that help you? No, because you don't have an asymptotic number of documents, uh, but it seems to work pretty well. Uh, Molly, Dustin, and I have a paper uh, that's in an edited volume. You can find on my website. Um, it's, the title is like Navigating the Local Modes of Topic Models, something, something, something. Uh, that's all about this problem and how you evaluate. And we have lots of functions built in that shows you the variations across lots of different runs of the model. And so, um, but at the end of the day, the problem is, is what is right for you is a function of your research question. And so there's no... We can make it as easy as possible for you to see lots of alternatives and see the differences, but we can't really tell you which one's right. We have a bunch of criteria if you want to sort of kick it to some external criteria, but there's no reason to believe those criteria will be right for your particular application. So I, I guess what I was wondering is, um, even if that's deterministic, and even if you know, you've got your trillion documents, there might be a, you know, a local maximum that's very close to the global maximum. So I guess what I'm curious about is not is maybe how different those would be. I'm thinking of like community detection in networks. I might compare how different the community sets I get are, and if they're all fairly similar, I feel like you know, no matter which one I get, they're all going to be pretty good in that sense. Yeah. So, so the key is like you know finding them, right? So there's there's, there's going to be a ton of them. Is the is the issue? Um, there is some functions in the package. Um, I think it's called like multi-mode. Or multi, mm, is that the function? I don't know. There's a function in the package. I think it's called multi-mode scheme. I don't think I have it on here. Um, that will like track for you a bunch of different runs and let you compare them. But the thing is, I, I guess the thing is, is that I feel like going back to the idea of there's no globally best method, there's no right um, uh, uh, model of the data. Um, even if we could find the global maximum, it's not clear that that would be the right measurement instrument for you. And it's also not clear, and this is a stronger statement, but it's also not clear that even if that mode was fairly sensitive, like that that, that maximum was fairly sensitive to, to perturbations, that that would necessarily make it a bad measurement instrument. Right? Like what you need to know is that it's going to look, um, that it's capturing the thing that you want it to capture on the documents you have, and preferably on some documents out of sample. Um, but that's, like I said, that's a much stronger, it's a much stronger statement about like the nature of discovery, which I'll talk a bit more about later today. But, yeah. So, how do people choose what's the metadata, and what's the effect of choosing different kind of metadata in these models on actual the effect? I assume that you answered that it's about the research question, but what's actually have you? Check what's the effect if you drop something from the metadata or add that something to the metadata. Yeah, so when you change things around in the content covariates, things change really, really dramatically because it's sort of uh, 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 creating a situation where like you're, you're talking about variations in the topics and you're like sort of giving this whole other component to the, to the way the words are generated. So let's set that to side for a second and just talk about prevalence. Um, as you drop things in and out of prevalence, it's not going to be like a huge difference. The things that you're looking for are things that provide information in terms of like documents that have similar values of the covariates are likely to have similar topics. It's also helpful if it's something like you want to do analysis on later, right? So if you want to make a comparison about the rates at which different newspapers are talking about a topic, then you want to include the newspaper information. Um, if you're doing analysis of contracts and you want to sort of find some way of tying together these different pieces you've split out of a given contract, it's, it's helpful for doing that. Because it's basically inducing a little hierarchical model over the, the different sections. So um, I think it's the way I tend to think about it, and this is where the name comes from, is you want to think about what is the structure in, in your corpus where ideas are going to repeat or patterns in the language are going to repeat. So following up on this discussion, um, something that I can't quite get my head around is, let's say you have a hypothesis that prevalence um, varies according to, um, you know, men or women speakers. Yeah. But you're measuring that assuming that prevalence will change based on 
male or female speakers. Right. So doesn't that then bias, um, you know, in some way the like post um, estimation regressions that you're going to run or whatever? Yeah. Um, because you're assuming that there's a difference and then testing if there's a difference. Absolutely. So, um, so you're not really assuming there's a difference. You are, in fact, and it is biased, but it's actually biased away from your hypothesis, okay. which is sort of interesting. Um, so there is regularization on these things that are drawing the effects towards zero. So it's, it's sort of drawing it towards the assumption that there isn't an effect. Okay. And it is, um, so we, we walk through this in the, there's a paper we have on open-ended survey response. We have a bunch of simulations, and we sort of walk, walk through the logic of this. We also have a paper in um, Journal of the American Statistical Association where we also do some simulations and walk through it. But it, it basically, it's a combination of the fact that the regularization pushes you away from that and the fact that, like, essentially what you're gaining by modeling the difference is, is some efficiency in the, um, in the long run. So, like, it allows you to find patterns, like we show in the, the JASA paper, you can find patterns in much smaller numbers of documents, whereas it just is super erratic if you're, like, doing it with LDA. But it is, um, but I completely understand the skepticism, and, um, and it's something that we're, we're going to actually talk about a bit more in my talk this afternoon, we talk about causal inference and in text analysis because um, from a causal inference perspective, this is like definitely problematic. And there, not to spoil the talk, the answer is train test splits, where you sort of do something in the training sample, you learn a topic thing, and then you check it on the test set. Cool. Okay, so um, STM has lots of fun functions to help you do things. Um, I was going to go through some sample applications, but I don't want to suck up all of Chris's time. Um, Could you give us just one? Sure. I think that, that's plenty of time. Yeah. Um, what would be good? Um, yeah, OK. Um, yeah, this is, this is my version, incidentally, of Gary's like 21 project slides, um, <laughs> except there's fewer. Um, so. Um, so uh, one that I like because I think it's just sort of interesting is um, and, and sort of highlights the fact that these things are, are language agnostic. Um, we, we did some work on um, text analysis in comparative politics, which is the political science word for domestic politics that are not in the US. Do not know why, uh, but there you go. Um, and uh, we were interested in um, uh, fatwas, which are in, in Islam like basically like legal rulings, like you ask sort of a question of a cleric and they like give you an answer and the thought was of the answers. Um, and so we were sort of interested in the way that these um, uh, 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 fatwas differ uh, by clerics that support some form of violent jihad and those that don't. So we have the giant database of these things. We can sort of run a big topic model, and then you can make some comparisons along all these different topics in like areas that you know, are more associated with, with those sort of clerics that are advocating some violent ideology. And in fact, you know, you see things that sort of make sense, that there's some, there's some things about fighting and struggle that are much more um, likely to show up under, under people that support uh, violent jihad, and things like, you know, discussions about prayer and Ramadan that are much less. But it gives us sort of way of uh, contextualizing, and in this paper we also sort of look at correlation patterns, like what kinds of topics show up together. The thing that I'm really excited about, and I'll just say very quickly, is that we've done a bunch of these things, but there's also a lot of applications that are happening outside our group. This is the part that gets me really pumped. Um, there's, at this point, about 25 published articles in over 20 different journals. They're all up on the Structural Topic Model website. If you do a paper with STM, like shoot me an email and let me know, and I'll add it to the website. Um, if you're thinking about doing something with STM, it's People have told me it's a very nice resource because you can sort of see how other people have like talked about the model and used it and visualized it and all those sorts of things. And so um, I, I highly encourage you to check that out. But it's also like, and this is the fun thing about methodology, right? And for those of you who want to build new tools, this is like, probably for all of you just for being in computational social science, this is the fun part, right? We get to jump fields in great ways. And so it's been used in education and political science and climate science and uh, transportation systems is one of my favorite. Um, there's a movie studio that uses it. I mean, it's great stuff, guys. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun to just kind of have things picked up and used in different corners of the world for things you didn't sort of dream of when you were building the tool. Um, okay. 
So, um, so I think there's a lot of opportunities for text analysis in the social sciences. This isn't the, the be all end all. Um, we just were trying to create a package that made it easy for people to get access to this, but there's better things coming all the time. Um, we have a new model that is uh, uh, particularly focused on document context and nice open source R package. Um, there's also some nice auxiliary packages uh, that help you visualize correlation structure, that help you browse your documents and look at covariate relationships. And there's a little function that outputs to the LDA viz package, which is really a, a, another beautiful, um, all, all of these things basically generate like D3 browsers that you can, like little websites for you that you can run, which is it's fabulous. Um, there's other great packages for LDA and R, just because I'm the one talking doesn't mean like you have to do STM. Um, there's, there's three major ones, Mallet, Topic Models, and LDA. Um, I, I, I strongly recommend Mallet. Um, the, these other two are, are sort of, they're, they're nice, they're, they're bare bones sort of implementations of LDA. Topic Models wraps the original LDA code. LDA is a fast collapse give sampler. Uh, Mallet is a very highly refined over many years, does lots of little things very well. Uh, it's a great package, so um, sometimes it gives some trouble installing, but like, because it has dependency on Java and those who have okay. done stuff in R know that that sometimes causes problems in R, but, um, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a great package. Um, I've also, you know, skipped over lots and lots of important details, but at, at a certain level, you know, I think the thing to do is just jump in and try some stuff um, and, then, and then go back and do a lot of, you know, reading to make sure you, you understand what's going on. But often it's just helpful to jump in and, like, get some intuition. So um, uh, that's it. Um, if you are going to read a bit more, these are some suggestions. I'll just tell you very briefly what's going on here. So this paper by Dave Bly, who, like, invented LDA, is a, is a good accessible introduction to what's going on. This paper is the thing that I was saying Mallet does right, is that it does hyperparameters well. Uh, so does STM by its very construction. Uh, and, and in fact, STM without covariates, by the way, works very well. It's not quite LDA. It's something called correlated, a correlated topic model, because it allows correlation in the topics, but it's, it's close. Um, this paper explains why doing that stuff is so important. Uh, this is the paper overview paper I wrote with Justin Grimmer. This is the sort of first piece that we published about the structural topic model. And then um, this paper down here uh, is by three real veterans in, uh, of, of topic models in the social science, uh, in, um, in computer science, who have done a lot of work with social scientists at various points. And they do a nice job of sort of talking about some of the idiosyncrasies, and it's in this, this edited volume, but it's, uh, it's quite a nice piece and, and worth reading. Anyway, that's it. Thank you so much, and um, I'll be around today, and I'll be talking to you guys later as well.